Nick Murphy from the Bayside. Welcome to the Iron Man podcast. How are you, Nick? I'm fine. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, I'm oh, really thank, good. Thank, thank you for coming on, man. It was a pleasure. Absolute legend oh. of the dance scene. And uh, But, I mean, we've got to get back to the beginning of the story, get back to the moments of how it all sort of happened. I mean, now it's now it's the original bass heads. I mean, it's not just the bass heads, it's the original bass heads because it is the original music and it goes back to that date and time of the original rave scene. And I'm curious about, you know, how that, how you really started? I mean, I mean, because I mean, everybody's got a story of they bought a keyboard, a synth, uh, something, something, and that's what really kind of got it into. But what, 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 what was your story? How did you start? Well, yeah, my story was that I was a, a very nerdy thing, which is as a sort of an anoraki thing um, to be, which was a home recording guy, and there was a magazine called Home and Studio Recording. You know, you yeah, you, you kept it pretty quiet because it was a pretty anoraki naff sort of thing to do. So I'd been doing that for quite a long time with various local artists or whatever. Um, but mainly because I was a songwriter originally myself and I was in the band and stuff. So naturally I thought it's it's much better to record people who can write proper songs and you know, and work with proper songs. I can just do enjoy the engineering side of it, uh, with my tape machine and little studio setup. So I really enjoyed that for about 10 years. And that took me on a journey, really, accumulating in. Um, the the bass heads, really, was the pinnacle of that um, time. And obviously, it gave me the, re- the foundation um, for getting into dance music, electronic dance music, about 1989, around that period of time. I'd done some dance music a little bit with somebody else, but um, we were in the dark a little bit about that. But um, by the time <laughs> I messed up with my partner in bass heads, uh, um, we we got you know quite quite fortunate in terms of connections and stuff like that, and uh, eventually um, progressing on in that way. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when you go in to make a record, a dance record at that time, I mean, there's obviously a scene, there's a rave scene going on, um, but I mean, I mean, the bass heads sound was quite synonymous with what you guys did and and what the bass head sound was but i mean what was your influences before you made any bass head records what was the dance records or what was the was it the the, the kind of chicago house scene the detroit house scene? i mean what, what was grabbing your attention was it any of that or was it anything at all like that or was it something um no no not at all i mean i'd, I'd gone to a couple of wine bars and had rumours that there was a rave, somebody had broken into a warehouse somewhere. And we went to these um, warehouses before the police eventually arrived. And the music was freaking amazing. Oh, I didn't know anything about dance music. That was my first thing into it. So, um, um, but certainly nothing other than those couple of experiences, really. Nothing really of any any. No, I, I didn't know anything about dance music at all. I mean, I was just sort of put my sort of progressive rock sort of influences on on the bass head stuff. Not pressure. When I say progressive rock, quite quite sort of intellectual sort of, you know, Genesis type stuff and and things like that, you know, um, not out and out rock, but, um, but certainly the things that I liked and I sort of, you know... Um, uh, that, that that's roughly where the influence came, but uh, my my, I think both of our inference was that we wanted to do something that was a bit different. It was this was a an opportunity to do that to get mm-hmm. away from the status quo um, of of just the eighties really, where there were just huge stars, you know, making this pop music or whatever. I don't know if it's time for a change. Maybe there's an opportunity for you know people like myself to to maybe get involved in that and um mm. boy we did yeah it was great and, and wasn't that i mean i mean obviously i was part of the scene as well back then and, and i remember this whole band sort of it was almost like a bandwagon situation where the, the you know as you say the pop stars at the time if you weren't incredibly good at dancing incredibly good at you know or you had that look yeah. Uh, you, you didn't get a chance you weren't you never but 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 the rave scene changed all that didn't it i mean the rave scene really gave people 
a chance to that were talented also, but gave them a chance to go to to a platform and make music and 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 still be appreciated. That was that was a big thing. It was a big change from from the eighties, as you call it. You know that that era where. It was Boy George and <laughs> Duran Duran and all that stuff. Not, I mean, not nothing against their music, but it was it, it gave other people a chance. The rave scene, didn't it? I mean, it was kind of like the 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 mystery people behind the the, <laughs> the computer somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I I come from both worlds because I was yeah. part of that VIP nightclub scene. You know, the, the String Fellows, uh, Rupert's on the world. Um, uh, late course and the, all the very and the clubs up in Manchester there were nightclubs up there that unless you nobody paid to get in but you had to know the you had to know the people to get in and that was that was the way it worked and mm. uh, and I was all part of that scene um, growing up um, in, in in the early twenties or whatever um, but I I mean we had a we had a a nightclub in Birkenhead called Atmospheres which was. Uh, was a was a basically a copy of Millionaires in Manchester, which was, you know, it's very expensive to get in, very expensive drinks, and everything was chrome and polished, and and anyway, so they opened that up, and within a few years, that sort of died a death, and the ravers were dancing on the tables, dancing on the bar, they were dancing everywhere, and it was <laughs> like, what the heck is this? And it was my partner who was running that night, um, in atmosphere on a Monday night, but the place was full of people. You know who couldn't normally get anywhere near those. The VIP scene was a very private thing, and and yeah. the rave scene liberated it so that you know the majority, the the, the the VIP scene I call it was was for them for a minority few, um, which started with the gentlemen's clubs in the early fifties and sixties or whatever, and then it just continued into my generation, and then then eventually uh, we're in a situation now where. Everybody who's sort of stuck in the house can can get out and and have fun and meet people and uh, you know just let everybody uh, in, in have, enjoy themselves in a, in a in a much better way than we ever did, you know just yeah. standing around having the old dance, ten pints of yeah. lager, driving home, you know. <laughs> my brother, used to, my brother used to say to me, you know, don't drink and drive unless you take the car. Uh, so <laughs> you're put that bit out. Anyway, um, but um, yeah, so it liberated everything, um, but obviously it had its problems, and um, yeah, eventually um, it sorted itself out now into what it is today. But obviously the government were trying to put a stop to it because it's a bit of a weird one. Um, yeah. yeah, hopefully. So that what was, what was the first record that you could have pinpointed to say that's base heads? The very first record that you ever made, and you kind of we, went. We were never copying anybody. I had no influence whatsoever. I mean, you could take who can make me feel good. Um, one of my idols was a guy called Paul Brooks, who was a keyboard player in a, in a cabaret covers band. Um, but he could, he could write. He could, you could give him a song, and he would be on a train somewhere and just do all the notation, slap it down, do the strings, do the drums, do the bass, do everything all to tape. Bang! That'd be brilliant. And that that's where the who can make me feel good piano riff riffs come from. So it's not it's not from a dance background at all. Um, um, yeah, back to the old school was definitely that warehouse night when we when the people broke into the warehouse and I heard something like that and I thought atmospherically wise it's very similar um, to that particular track, you know. I mean, back back to the old schools. I, I mean, I mean, obviously a, a brilliant record, but I mean, the record that I suppose is the one that everybody just goes straight away. That's basehead. Is is there anybody out there? I mean, and 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 for you, I mean, it's funny because we've obviously had chats before, and 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 you almost go, but that's not really basehead, but but. It, I mean, obviously, that's the track that people associate immediately with bass heads. Is 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 there anybody out there? I remember playing it on as I, I think we've chat, chatted before. Yeah. I was playing it on white white labels and stuff, and, and 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 back in the day. And and so, I mean, what what what? I mean, how did that change things? That record for you? It it, it did change things. It meant that we went from being, you know, people who are on a nice journey, on a, on, a, on an upward curve. You know, we did our first EP and 
you know, by accident with the, the, the track I sent you the other day, the what is love thing, that was every, what everybody gravitated towards. So in a way it was a failure had it not been for that track. Um, but uh, we got a lot of press over that uh, and surprisingly there was a lot of admir admiration for it. And, um, um, you know, so that was, that was the first thing. But when we did the second EP, we had no idea that Who Can Make Me Feel Good was the one that was going to blow up, but everybody was playing that. So it felt like we got rescued again. Um, we yeah. had no idea. And, uh, and that was that, that sort of marked at that point. And then we, after that, we did Back to the Old School. And then we did the Is A Bit Out There thing after that. Um, but That's was like that four, record number four, really, in the in the chain of command. Yeah. Is, yeah. I, I, and, yet, and yet, I think that's the, the great thing about the, the Is There Anybody Out There is, is obviously that seemed to get even more exposure, even more uh, things. Go. So I think what happened, I certainly I know a lot of people I've spoken to uh, prior to this conversation, and, and they said, you know, when they heard it, Is There Anybody Out There, they went back looking for other bass head records and then they found back to the old school and so on and so forth they found the other so they went back the way rather than you know because the, the, i mean i don't know of, of what happened with the distribution and the early stuff as much as it, but when it when, you know is there anybody out there really got that massive distribution thing going on or it seemed to be anyway yeah i mean it was really boiling up though i mean Margie and I went to Ibiza and we took a pile of records, thought we'll 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 track down all the top DJs in Ibiza, you know. And we just went round all the places and we went to the Cafe Del Mar on the beach there and he went, No, this isn't right for us. I said, Listen, mate, turn it over, there's a track on there. And it was like this trippy thing. Oh yeah, this is great. But look, I remember going to Angel was it Angels in Ibiza? There was a Alfredo Alfredo, the DJ oh, there. Alfredo, yeah, yeah, DJ Alfredo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Alfredo, yeah. So I'm standing there patiently, and then the guy says, what do you want? I said, I want to speak to the DJ. Okay, he'll be over in a minute. And uh, I said, oh, um, excuse me, I, I don't want to bother you, but I've got this record here. And he, and he looks at it. He says, I'll be back in a minute. He comes back in a minute. He says, I'm playing it half an hour. I've already got it. Thanks anyway. <laughs> and it was like that. It was like that. They'd all got them, just like you had. <laughs> <laughs> 